Japanese preparations for war, but did not know that the Japanese fleet had already put to sea. The White House learned the Japanese embassy was burning documents. On the night of December 6, 1941, intercept stations picked up heavy Japanese radio traffic from Tokyo to their embassy in Washington. The machines clattered with the intercepted purple code groups. The tapes were rushed to the code breakers on Constitution Avenue where the ciphers were decrypted. The text was then teletyped to the State Department. It ordered the Japanese ambassador to break off diplomatic relations at precisely 1 p.m. Washington time, when the sun was just rising over the Hawaiian Islands. Hickam Field, Pearl Harbor. Boeing B-17 fortresses are lined up wingtip to wingtip. On battleship row are seven battleships. The first bomb exploded at 7.55 a.m. with the battleships as the principal targets. In two hours, it was all over. 3,500 lay dead or wounded and seven battleships were reported lost. Could the attack have been anticipated? Should President Roosevelt have known about it in advance? When, when I'm asked the question about uh, Roosevelt's having advance information, I ask where could it have come from? And uh, the offer is made that it came from the British, that the British were breaking the Japanese codes and had the information, gave it to Churchill, and Churchill gave it to Roosevelt. We go back to the first stage of that uh, premise, and that is that Japan was sending out messages that indicated they were going to attack Pearl Harbor. And my question is, to whom would they be sending such messages? There was no one on God's green earth they should be sending such messages. Now, we have, since the war, gone back and reviewed the messages, uh, the Japanese uh, JN-25 series messages, that were intercepted prior to Pearl Harbor. And there are some uh, 10,000 of those messages that were intercepted between 1 September and 7 December 1941. Uh, they were reviewed after the war, and uh, some 12 or 1,300 of the messages were thought um, important enough to translate. And they were translated by my colleagues who were waiting to accumulate enough retirement points to get out of the Navy and get back to what they wanted to do in the first place. And so they were set to work do doing these 1,200 messages. They're all down in the archives. And if you go through those messages knowing about the attack on Pearl Harbor, you can see things that suggest there was going to be an attack. And if you know, as we now know, that the target was Pearl Harbor, you can easily read into those messages that it was exclusively Pearl Harbor. Reading the Japanese diplomatic traffic made it clear to U.S. intelligence that Japan was preparing for war and U.S. forces were on the alert throughout the Pacific. But no one ever imagined that the entire Japanese battle fleet could sail halfway across the Pacific to attack Hawaii without being seen. Most senior U.S. officials believed that the Philippines were the most likely target, but they were wrong. Since the unprovoked and dastardly attack by Japan on Sunday, December 7th, 1941, a state of war has existed between the United States and the Japanese Empire. After Pearl Harbor, America was at war and arms production became the top priority. Though the attack had crippled the Pacific Fleet, the aircraft carriers Enterprise and Lexington were safely at sea when the Japanese attacked. At Pearl, work began immediately to raise and repair the damaged battleships. And away from the dockyards, in underground bunkers, Commander Joe Rochefort and his small team of code breakers were ordered to attack the vital Japanese fleet code JN-25 to learn where the next blow would come. JN-25 was the Japanese Navy's main operational code, whereas the purple machine was a diplomatic cipher used by the Foreign Office and the diplomats. 
It was a, purple was difficult to solve, but once solved was easier to go along with. On the other hand, JN25 was a more difficult code to solve, not because of anything inherent in it, but because we had fewer intercepts, therefore less to work on. JN25 was a tough code system with over 45,000 groups. The words of the messages were first transposed into five-figure groups. Then, from another code book, random numbers were added to produce the groups that were actually sent. The sender also included a key to enable the receiver to remove the random numbers and get back to the original code. Tommy Dyer, one of Rochefort's key aides, was so short-staffed he was assigned the bandsman from the battleship California, which had been sunk at Pearl, to operate the unit's IBM machines. Everyone worked around the clock to break JN-25. By April 1942, they began to decode almost complete messages, like this one detailing the destroyer escorts for Japanese carriers, and they learned of a major new attack. The Japanese sent the carriers Zuikaku and Shokaku to attack Port Moresby in New Guinea. After Rochefort showed him the messages, Admiral Chester Nimitz sent the Yorktown and Lexington to intercept the Japanese in the Coral Sea, but they failed to make contact. However, on May the 7th, Navy planes searching for the Japanese carriers spotted another force escorting enemy troop ships towards New Guinea. They attacked it and sank the carrier, the Shoho, in just 10 minutes. The American codebreakers had helped to score a major victory. It was the first Japanese ships turned back. The next day, both the main carrier forces launched airstrikes. The Japanese carriers escaped with little damage, but the USS Lexington was hit and eventually had to be abandoned. For Nimitz, it was a grievous loss of both men and a major ship. But for the Japanese Navy, the Coral Sea was a disaster. Admiral Yamamoto now knew his only chance of winning the war was to lure the remainder of the U.S. fleet into battle and annihilate it. He prepared the largest Japanese battle fleet ever assembled. Admiral Nimitz was now faced with impossible odds. He had just three active carriers to cover the vast spaces of the Pacific. If he positioned his ships in the wrong place, it would leave Hawaii or the West Coast undefended and might well cost America the war. Long-range reconnaissance aircraft scanned the seas around Hawaii, but Nimitz had to depend on the skill of Rochefort and his code-breaking team at Pearl. In May, the team decoded a message that identified the next Japanese target as AF. But where was AF? In Washington, many believed that the target was the Aleutians, but the Naval Chief of Staff thought the target was Pearl Harbor. Rochefort's team believed it was Midway and suggested a way to confirm their hunch. Midway Island had no independent water source. And uh, they were dependent entirely on a desalinization plant. And he suggested that if a message could be sent from Midway saying that uh, uh, they're, they're short on water, send a tanker full of fresh water, that that might uh, cinch it as to the identification of Midway. So. They got Admiral Nimitz's approval for it, called the commanding officer at Midway, told him to send a message in a low-level code uh, that said uh, they needed fresh water. And within two days, the Japanese had said, AF has a problem. <laughs> They're short on water. <laughs> and that was the proof they needed. Midway was put on the alert. But many of the Washington naval staff still believed Nimitz was falling into a Japanese trap. The Japanese plan was typically complex. The Aleutians would be attacked as a diversion to draw Nimitz north. 24 hours later, the bulk of the Japanese force would wipe out the U.S. fleet, allowing invasion troops to occupy Midway. Nimitz made a desperate gamble. Acting solely on the intelligence from his codebreakers, he committed his entire carrier fleet to head off the attack on Midway. They took up a position northeast of Midway and sent search planes to locate the Japanese fleet some 200 miles to the west. 